All right, this is chapter 13, section 3, part 2, continuing from yesterday. Uh, development of achievement and motivation. Research suggests that children with learning goals often have parents who encourage them to be present and enjoy schoolwork and to find their own ways to solve problems whenever possible. Such parents create opportunities to expose their children to new and stimulating experiences. Parents of children with performance goals, on the other hand, are more likely to reward their children with toys or money for good grades and to punish them for poor grades. It's exactly what my mother did. Development of achievement. And yesterday we were talking about achievement, motivation, and types of goals. So, continuing on. Development of achievement. Research also shows that parents of children with high achievement motivation tend to be generous with their praise when their children do well. So, they always say, like, hey, good job, you did this, you did that. Um, I know when my kid does really good in school during the week... I'll take her out to the toy store and say, hey, go pick out a toy since you know you paid attention in school and you got some good grades. Such parents are also less critical of their children when they do poorly. The children themselves set high personal standards and relate their feelings of self-worth to their achievements, so whatever they accomplish. All right, the stimulus, making things fit. The stimulus motives we have been discussing are examples of psychological needs aimed at increasing our level of stimulation. However, many psychological needs are aimed at reducing stimulation or tension, especially in interactions with other people. These types of psychological needs are based on people's need to maintain a balance between their personal beliefs, actions, and thoughts. Cognitive consistency um, this is called cognitive consistency. Cognitive theorists such as Leon Festinger and Sarah B. maintain that people are motivated to achieve cognitive consistency. That is, what is cognitive consistency? That is, they seek to think and behave in a way that fits what they believe and how others expect them to think and behave. What the heck am I talking about? All right, so according to Leon... People are primarily motivated to behave according to their beliefs. Therefore, a person who is politically liberal or Democrat would find it difficult to support a conservative candidate. So someone who is of the same mind thinking as Joe Biden right now, it would be hard for them to support a conservative candidate like Donald Trump. So if you are supporting not saying that you are liberal or Democrat, but if you support Joe Biden right now over Donald Trump, you have a more, um, you ha if you're supporting Joe Biden over Donald Trump, you, you have a more liberal thinking or democratic view of government versus a more conservative Republican view. It's just two different types of thinking. Or you could be right in the middle, and that would be considered independent. You might agree with um, some things that Joe Biden might say, and you might agree with some things that Donald Trump might say. Or you might not agree with either of them. All right, so according to Beam, most girls and boys try to behave in ways that are consistent with what people expect of females and males in their society. Most people prefer that the pieces of their lives fit together. They seek out, um, as friends, those have values and interests similar to their own. So people seek out people that tend to have um, the same beliefs or do the same activities and the same hobbies. I know I hang out with a lot of surfers and skateboarders because that's what I do. As they grow older, most people try to find a set of beliefs that will help them understand the world in which they live. Most people feel better when the important relationships in their lives are stable and ordinary. Uh, two theories that address this need to create cognitive consistency are balance theory and cognitive desolence theory. 
And according to balance theory, people need to organize their perceptions, opinions, and beliefs in a harmonious manner. So they need to all come together and flow together like harmony. Um, they want to maintain a cognitive balance by holding consistent views and by being with people who share the same beliefs and values. When the people we like share our attitudes, there is a state of balance that gives us a feeling that all is well. Imagine a group of high school students who are good friends. The group includes a mix of girls and boys, and each excels at a different subject. But why is this group of friends so close? According to the balance theory, they have probably discovered that they share many of the same values, interests, and beliefs. Balance theory also suggests that when we care about a person, we tend to share her or his interests. I'd like to say my wife and I share the same interests, even though we are kind of the opposite. Some of the group of friends, for example, may not have been interested in attending a classical violin recital. However, one person in the group loves to perform music and invented the rest of the group, invited, sorry, the rest of the group to her violin recital. Because of their friendship, the group attended the recital because they care about the person. That makes sense. I've done this plenty of times when I was in high school. There was plenty of things I didn't want to do, but I probably wanted to impress a girl or somebody else, so I went and did it anyway. In this way, they are introduced to and developed a positive feeling about something that one member liked. Yes, I can definitely remember a couple of times where I went to certain events or uh, group gatherings with a friend because I knew she liked it, and I wasn't going to say no because um, I was open to it too. I was open to new experiences and you know what it actually turned out to be pretty cool because I opened up you know my mind a little bit and I expanded my horizons and I learned a bunch and I, and I met new people doing that too. Psychologists note that people who have strong feelings for each other as one couple in the group does might be upset to discover that a major area of disagreement. Okay, so such disharmony would place them in a state of imbalance. Uh-oh. When someone we care about disagrees with us, an uncomfortable state of imbalance arises. We may attempt to end the uncomfortable state by trying to persuade the other person to change his or her attitude by changing our feelings about the other person. Uh, so sometimes I get in disagreements with my wife, but we, we do come to a neutral understanding on most topics, but it's okay to disagree with some people. You don't have to agree with everything. But you might try to convince that person, like, hey, maybe you should see things this way. Hey, maybe you should see that way. Just be open. Have an open mind. Relationships can usually survive disagreements about such things as different tastes in food or difference of opinion about a movie. However, more basic conflicts such as over religion, politics, especially politics, and personal values can create a state of imbalance. Oh, no bueno. When we dislike a certain people or we have no feelings towards them... Uh, one way or another, their attitudes are not as much interest to us because we do not care about them. We are not greatly affected by the disharmony between the views and ours. I can think of a bunch of people who I don't uh, care about their opinion with. We can be said, uh, we can be said that um, the state of non-balance. We can be said to be in a state of non-balance. So, unlike imbalance, which tends to upset people non-balance usually leaves people feeling indifferent. So you might feel non-balanced towards somebody you don't like or you don't even care about. All right, moving on. Why do people find a state of imbalance uncomfortable? The answer is that people want their thoughts and attitudes, cognitions, to be consistent with their actions. Awareness of our cognitions are inconsistent um, with our behavior is unpleasant. It causes an inner tension which can be uncomfortable. According to cognitive distance theory, dissonance theory, cognitive dissonance theory, people are more motivated to reduce this inconsistency. Okay. Awareness that our cognitions are inconsistent with our behavior is unpleasant. 
and according to cognitive distance and theory, people are motivated to reduce this inconsistency. Okay, okay. Classical research on cognitive distance um, was conducted by psychologists. Um, participants in their experiment were divided into two groups. Both groups performed a boring task such as turning pegs. The people in one group were paid $20 to tell the other person that the boring task was interesting. The people in the second group were paid only $1 to say that the boring task was interesting. Afterward, the participants asked to express their own actual feelings about the task, and the people who received $1 related the test is more interesting than the people who were paid $20. Now, why is this? According to the cognitive distance theory, this occurred because the people who received $1 felt an inconsistency or a dissonance between their cognition. That is what a boring task is or their action. I just told someone that the task was interesting. That people who received $20 could easily justify lying about what they have felt about the task because doing so was worthwhile financially. Okay, so if you give me more money to do something, I'll probably just lie about it and say, yeah, 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 I, I agree with that because, you know, I don't really care because I'm making more money. By convincing, the, by convincing themselves that the task was more interesting than it really was, they were able to reduce the inconsistency between their cognition and their action. So if you pay somebody more money to do something, they might just agree with, you know, even though it's a boring task, uh, they might say, oh yeah, it wasn't that bad, but in reality, you know, they just care about receiving the money. What happens when two people in a relationship disagree about a key issue such as religion? A strong disagreement about an important issue can injure or even damage um, the relationship. Cognitive distance theory suggests that people having such basic disagreement may seek to reduce the distance by trying to pretend that the differences between them or unimportant, or even by denying that the differences exist, they may avoid thinking about those differences and put it off dealing with them as long as possible. So, you know, you might disagree with somebody, but you might like that person. Um, intention's going to build. I used to have a coworker that I did, you know, I really liked working with her, but we shared such different views, and it just kept building up and building up, and we ended up arguing a lot, and it really damaged our working relationship. But sometimes you got to work through it, you don't get to choose your coworkers, and you don't get to choose your neighbors. There's some things you don't get to choose in life, so you got to pick up the pieces and move on. If we have ever dealt with other people, imbalance or cognitive distance would never occur. It's true. So if you lived up in Alaska in the bush, you would never even see anybody for a year. Uh, but humans are social beings. The desire to join with others and being part of something larger than oneself is called affiliation. The desire to affiliate prompts people to make friends, join groups, and participate in activities with others. During adolescence, the motive for affiliation with one's peers is particularly strong. It is a time of life when one discovers how peers provide emotional support, useful advice, and pleasurable company. Affiliation motivates... Affiliation motivation helps keep families, groups, and nations together. And uh, I guess that's how everything kind of works. However, some people are so strongly motivated to affiliate that they find it painful to be by themselves. Sometimes a strong need to affiliate may be a sign of anxiety. Huh, maybe I'll have anxiety because after a while of being alone for a, a week or so, if my wife and kid, you know, leave and go see their um, my wife goes and sees her parents and I'm alone for three days. I start to feel a little bit of anxiety. I start to feel lonely, but that's just me. Some people like to be alone. All right, so anxiety increases the desire to affiliate. And in one study, one psychologist did, he had a group of people and he told this group of people that, hey, you're going to be shocked, um, a mild shock. And so out of this group of people, two-thirds, and they were given the choice of, do you want to be alone uh, when you receive the shock, or do you want to be with somebody else when you get the shock? And two-thirds of the group agreed um, to be with another person or be with a group. So one-third decided to receive this mild shock um, by themselves. So the conclusion was that 
anxiety tends to cause people to want to affiliate with other people. So that's why two thirds of them chose to be with a group of people when they received this pain, as opposed to the one third that received who wanted to receive this um, by themselves. So people tend to want to be near people is what this um, uh, study really showed, especially when someone feels anxiety um, or being nervous. Uh, people want to be together with somebody else because it might relieve that anxiety. All right, other studies have shown that desire to affiliate with a group can lead people to disregard their own perceptions. So sometimes it's not always the case. All right, so a little bit of review, what we talked about. Um, all people seek sensory stimulation. Some people feel driven to high achievement, others don't, like couch potatoes. People seek to balance their beliefs, actions, and thoughts, and humans are motivated to be social. So, that is your lesson for today. Hopefully you learned something. All right, peace out.